You're listening to P-R-O-X. You know what you said to me? You said, hey, man, look, I wrote this for you. I believe you're a star. I know you're a star. Let's go show the world. That's crazy. And I don't know if that was directly cool coming through and just giving me the gym that I needed in that moment. You know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> who would have known? But I carried that with me because I was like, man, this dude who just met me believed that I was a star. You know what I'm saying? And believed I could do it. And that kind of gave me that first initial, like, I belong here mm. type of uh, feeling, mm. you know what I'm saying, in the industry. You're listening to In Proximity. On this episode, actually, hang on a sec. Since this is our first episode, let me set the scene before we start the show. At Proximity Media, we're a production company of creatives and executives making movies, TV shows, music, and podcasts. Our credits include films like Judas and the Black Messiah, Space Jam and New Legacy, and most recently, Creed III. We also made Wakanda Forever, the official Black Panther podcast and soundtrack, and we have a bunch of other projects on the way. You can check all that out on our website, proximitymedia.com. This show you're listening to right now, In Proximity, is a podcast about craft and career between friends and collaborators in Proximity's creative community. I'm Paula Mardo, producer and head of audio here, and I'll kick off every episode with a quick introduction before handing it off to a Proximity colleague and a guest. And they'll take it away from there with stories about first projects, major inflection points, creating with purpose and intention, and so much more. So thanks for pressing play and be sure to follow In Proximity on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app so you get notified when a new episode drops every Sunday. Now, let's get into it. For our first episode, we brought together one of our company founders, Ryan Kugler, and his longtime collaborator, Michael B. Jordan. Ryan and Michael's cinematic partnership has shaped culture and broken box office records through groundbreaking movies like Fruitvale Station, Creed, and Black Panther. On this episode, they reflect on when they first met to talk about Fruitvale Station, Ryan's first feature film, going to their first boxing match to prep for Creed, and what they've learned from building and running their own production companies. This episode was recorded while Michael was in post-production for his directorial debut, Creed, Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Michael B. Jordan, actor, producer, most recently director, founder of Outlier Society Production Company. And we're sitting in a screening room here in L.A. in the edit for Creed 3. Ryan Coogler, writer, director, producer, and co-founder of Proximity Media. And I'm here with my good friend and frequent collaborator, who I'm very proud of. Sitting here in a luxurious screening room. Much nicer than anything I had on my directorial <laughs> debut. But it's great. And we're talking about um how we've been in proximity with each other for the better part of a decade now, our professional careers. Yep. And really excited. So I remember when we first met. Yep. Very clearly. Didn't know it was going to be as big a deal professionally or, or personally for me. But I knew it was a big deal. I was excited. Mm. It was like not far from where we are now. Kind of like by Universal Studios area. It was significant productions. Yep. Nina Yang Bon Jovi, Forrest Whitaker's producing partner and one of the producers on Fruitville Station. And we were at her office with our casting director, Twinkie Bird. Right. We met there. And then I remember we walked across the street to the Starbucks. Yep. And sat down and talked. It's crazy to think that it's been about 10 years. Yep. I remember how you walked across the street. Why you say that? Because <laughs> <laughs> it was a busy street. One of them wide valley streets. And then you just walked out in front of the cars. <laughs> <laughs> it was our first time meeting, too. I didn't want to let you think I was a punk. Yeah. But, like, I'm also from Cali, like, where we kind of respect cars pretty good, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? And you was like, no, nah, they'll stop. <laughs> and I was like, this got to be an East Coast dude. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, it's got to be an East Coast thing. Because I've seen the New Yorkers, like, walk out in front of the cab, bang on the cab or whatever, you know. <laughs> hey, I'm walking here. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm walking here. And then, but you were right. You walked out there, the car stopped, you know, and I was like, okay, maybe this maybe this is a... Something to this? Yeah, something to this. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty accurate. Yeah, I remember that and sat down in the, you know, your little Starbucks seating little, section. Yep, yep. You. Little outdoor seating section. Yeah. But I, I mean, I got to keep it real with y'all. I was nervous for a lot of reasons. Like, the biggest thing was we had just got our script accepted in the Sundance Labs and we were coming out and had mm -hmm. a little bit of momentum. Mm -hmm. But we hadn't shared the screenplay with talent yet. I remember talking with your agents about, you know, we would sit down and meet first and then share the script. Yep. And I had made up my mind already that I wanted to cast you. I just was hoping that we would get along 
a little bit, you know, yeah, like yeah, I was, yeah, you know, yeah. I was fresh out of school, you know, yeah. so like I worked with professional actors, but none of them were, you know, really established. Mm -hmm. And I just seen you in a couple movies, like it was Red Tails and Chronicle. You had a big year at that time. You want to talk a little bit about like where you were at professionally at that time? Yeah, and the crazy thing was for me, as much as you were nervous, I was nervous too, but I couldn't tell you were nervous at all. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that, let me start off by saying that because you had a certain sense of confidence to you. You know, I trusted what you were saying and I felt comfortable which is crazy because usually as an actor up until that point, never has it been, oh, no, this role was for me. So going into it, you know, I didn't know that you was like, <laughs> already had the job, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm still going into it like, man, I hope I'm right for it or I hope he thinks I'm the one for the role. And yeah, at that time of my career, coming off of Chronicle, one of my first bigger studio films, you know, it was still an ensemble cast, but I felt like a real lead role for me. And at that time, there's a lot of stuff swirling around in my head. You know, Trayvon Martin, murder had happened, and feeling frustrated as a young black man and not really having an outlet to really express myself, being quote-unquote known from shows or whatever like that, but not really feeling like I have any real power or impact on the world in that type of way, you know? And then there was wow. this thirst and this want to be a leading man. I didn't know if I was a leading man or not. I remember that. I remember asking you that in that meeting because I imagine in my own like naivety, there's a film that you had done when you were the lead or a short film. Or, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you were like, yeah, I've never been number one on a call sheet before. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I didn't even really know the call sheets were numbered at yep. the time, you yep. know? And then uh, it was a show, I think a pilot you were getting ready for. Yep. And I was like, well, are you the lead in that? And you was like, well, no, that's kind of an ensemble piece too. And I remember thinking in my head, this is crazy. Like, you know, <laughs> like obviously this guy is really talented. I didn't know how to feel about that. It was a part of me where I was like, like really excited that I wasn't going to be working with somebody who, like, been there and done that. Yeah. You know what you said to me? You said, hey, man, look, I wrote this for you. I believe you're a star. I know you're a star. Let's go show the world. That's crazy. And it was coming off the heels of this leading man conversation that we had. Wow. And not feeling like I've never been number one on the car shit. You were like, hey, man, look. And I don't know if that was director, you know, cool coming through and just giving me the gym that I needed in that moment. You know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> who would have known? But... I carried that with me because I was like, man, this dude who just met me believed that I was a star and then believed I could do it. And that was the agenda. That was the goal to go do that. Obviously, you know, with everything else around the movie as well. Yeah. But that was something that kind of stuck with me moving forward of like, yeah, I am. And I could do that too. And we continued to do that. You told me. Project after project. So that kind of gave me that first initial, like, I belong here mm. type of uh, feeling, mm. you know what I'm saying, in the industry. That's deep, man. I was really struck also by your story. Up until that point, I don't think I'd ever met anybody else from Newark. Okay. Well, I heard about it. It reminded me quite a bit of like where I'm from. Yep. Especially like Newark's relationship with New York City. Yep. And at that point, I think I'd only been to New York one time. When you were talking about it, it seemed a lot like the Bay Area. Like it's a lot of other cities that are in relationship to San Francisco and Oakland. But you got cultural differences, but the vibe is similar. And it felt like, oh, yeah, I understand this guy. Yep. You know? <laughs> if we'd have been in the same school, we would have been best friends. We yeah. would have played ball together. You're literally the West Coast bookend, I think, to me and my story, I feel like, mm -hmm. you know? Obviously different paths and different things along the way, but a shit ton of similarities. Yeah. And going to Oakland and you bringing me into that community and I can't go anywhere now, people think I'm from Oakland. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they like, hey man, you know, what part of Oakland are you from? And I'm like, oh, I'm from North, from Jersey. So where, where do I get that from? It's like, yeah, probably because like, you know, first three roles I ever played majorly were all from Oakland, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, you know, Oscar Grant, that was my way into that world and that community that really took me in as one of their own, you know what I'm saying? And I, and I really love that, man. I remember riding around with you. People would recognize you. Yep. People you wouldn't think. 1,000%. Hey, there goes... <laughs> oh, hey, what's the name? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They go, well, Wallace, Wallace or this or that. Yeah. Or Reggie. Where Reggie at? You know what I'm saying? And then when they found out, got wind that, you know, we were telling that story uh, in the community. Oh, yeah, we, yeah. I mean... yeah hometown hero to a whole nother level, man. Yeah. Like the city was such a warm embrace to like get that story told the right way. And yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. You know, it's a unique place. And they definitely put their arms around you. For sure. Yeah, I saw it happening. That's not guaranteed. No, no, you know? no, no, not yeah. at all. I, I'll be like this. The Wire definitely gave me a lot of goodwill. Yeah. In communities all over yeah, the world. Yeah, a lot, you know lot of street saying? credibility. A lot of street cred, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Even to like, you know, Oz family and stuff. was totally. like, hey, you know what? It's you? All right, cool. You, 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 you can yeah. tell the story. <laughs> I was like, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Shouts out to David Simon. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, and Alexa Fogel, right? Alexa, yeah, yeah, man.
honestly, I knew you, you know, fresh out of SC, so I knew you were close around my age at the time. And my first impression was like, oh, he just like me. You know, as a director and writer, you know, I had this idea in my head of like just, you know, authority figures and being above the actor in the hierarchy of on-set dynamics. And to see somebody who looked like me, who talked different, but still had a lot of things in common on just a personal level, on a human level, it just kind of like put in perspective what's possible. You kind of raised the ceiling of like capabilities of what I could do at my age, you know, and what I thought was possible. But the more I was talking to you through the movie and just the process, you know, all the other, like the business side of the creativity that we were doing as far as making the film, it was like, this guy is way more mature than me. <laughs> I was like, I mean, I was like, oh, this dude is responsible, like, like really responsible. Like I thought I was disciplined and like dedicated from the acting side, but this is a whole <laughs> nother level. Like this dude is like way more mature than me. Like how many kids you got? At the time, <laughs> he ain't got no kids. Then I was like, this is a dude with responsibilities, man. This dude live life. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that was bro. Well, fuck the track up, bro. From laughing. <laughs> hey, how many kids you got? I was like, no, at that point, that age, I, I, it was a, you was a dad in my mind, kids. bro. Without a doubt, you was a dad in my mind when I first met you. <laughs> that also kind of gave me confidence that I was in good hands. Proof Bro was your baby. That was a project you were extremely passionate about. You know what I'm saying? You wrote it. Anybody that's that passionate and cares that much about this one thing, I knew you were going to do any and everything to like make sure it was done the right way and done at the highest level. And that's the type of project I wanted to be involved in. That's the type of director I wanted to work for. That's the type of collaborator I wanted to be partner with. So I walked away from the meeting like immediately, walking across the street from Starbucks, going back to the office. There was no doubt on my mind that this was a project that I was going to do. And I was so excited for it because, yeah, I run through a brick wall for Coop literally from day one. That's what kind of like connection that I kind of felt. And yeah, that's that's one of the reasons why I ended up doing that movie. It was crazy. What was you saying? I think I was sleeping on Ludwig's couch okay. while I was down there. <laughs> <laughs> while I was down here in LA. I think I was sleeping on Ludwig on our proximity partner's couch, yeah. taking the meetings in LA and, and working. And I didn't have it together at all, man. But you know, it was super excited about the project and the opportunity to meet you. I wanted to ask you, bro, when's the last time you sat in a Starbucks like that? And can you even do it now? <laughs> I'm not going to say that was the last time, but I think that was one of the last times I, I think I sat in Starbucks and I can't sit in Starbucks right now. You can't do that no more, can you? Nah, Straight but, up, you can't. You nah, get mobbed. I'll get mobbed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, no. When I was thinking about us sitting there in that Starbucks and I compared and contrasted that when we went to that fight in 2014, I think it was, we went to a Mayweather fight together. We went to see him fight uh, when he yeah, fought Maya yeah. Donna the second time. Okay. We went as prep for Creed one, mm -hmm. just to go to a pro fight together and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of feel it and, and see. And I remember, bro, when we left that fight and people realized you were there, it took us like two hours to, to get, get out. To get out. To get people out. People kept grabbing you and taking yeah. pictures with you. Remember yep, this? Yep. And I realized you was famous. You had blown up. Mm -hmm. But going to that fight with you, we hadn't even shot Creed yet. Nope. There was no Black Panther. There was no... None of the other stuff you've done since then, like the stuff we've done together, the stuff you've done on your own and with other filmmakers, mm -mm. it gave me like a front row seat hmm. to what it must be like. I felt bad for you, bro. <laughs> like, honestly, I, I felt awful because like, people were grabbing you and forcing you into selfies. It was mostly women, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, like I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, man, you know, like, <laughs> you know, they was handing me the camera to take pictures of you. Like, and I, I felt for like five minutes, I was like, man, this is awesome. My boy blew up. And then for the next, like, hour and a half, <laughs> was like, I was like, holy shit. How do I get him out of no, here? No, but I, I was like, if Creed is a halfway decent movie, it's over for this dude. Man, and you know? that, that's exactly what happened. You actually saw me go from, oh, that guy looks familiar, to, oh, that's Michael B. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Totally. And it was a lot, man, to realize I couldn't go places that I normally could or relax or you know, somebody's always staring you because you know I'm from North you know I'm from certain places yeah, where like staring you know, at you somebody staring thing. at you is not a good thing yeah. you know what I'm saying so yeah. to get used to people are staring at you from yeah. in a different type of way and be able to differentiate between the and two you can't forget that anxiety like that inherited muscle memory of hey this person across the room is staring at me I gotta get out of here yep yeah. or that might be a threat or whatever it is yeah. and, and take that oh I'm not there anymore and this is different things and yeah. it could mean a term of endearment or somebody might be wanting to you know yeah. come up so to understand my responsibility as a 
public figure, as some yeah. like whatever it is now to be able to be open and be welcoming and approachable in a certain type of way. I gotta tell you something else too, we never yeah. talked about. The women that was grabbing you, taking yeah. pictures with you, not all of them were single. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Like I was seeing like some of their dates. That was with them. That was with them, yes. you know? <laughs> <laughs> And like how they was looking at you, I was, I was also like, wait a second, we might, you know. We might have to throw yeah, that in here. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was on my P's and Q's, bro. I was and like, we had a boxing fight, so you know everybody yeah, in there. Everybody, everybody got little, hands. Everybody a little sauced up, everybody a boxing fan. Everybody took one boxing class at least in there. I'm like, man, we might have to fight our way out of here. It was a couple one fights in the lobby. thousand percent. Yeah, it was, it was a couple fight. times when it was like, are we going to make it home? Oh, man. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So fast forward a decade later yep. after we met and we have production companies now. Yep. We business owners, yep. you know, leaders of companies that make things, that make products. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've found that it's incredibly challenging. It's incredibly rewarding. I use different muscles mm -hmm. doing that job than I do as a, as a writer, director. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about it, yep. you know, with you. And like, why did you choose after your success as an actor? You know, why mm -hmm. did you choose to found outlier societies? That's a great question. I think one of the reasons why I wanted to start my own production company, that kernel of an idea stemmed from Peter Berg with my time on Friday Night Lights and, you know, Jason Kadams. And being in that creative circle, how they created that show and how Pete navigated the industry. He was like, Mike, one day you're going to want to stop waiting for incoming phone calls and you're going to want to take control of your own destiny. So start writing. And start owning stuff. And this is Peter Berg, Peter Berg, the director. He directed the pilot of Friday Night Lights. Friday Night Lights. Executive producer. Executive producer. He came in and directed the pilot of seasons four and five, which my character, Vince Howard, starred on. And that was my first introduction to Pete in a personal way. You know, I was thirsty, man. I wanted to know what everybody did from the DP to the camera operators to, you know, the boom and the grips. How can I make everybody else's job easier? And I started asking Pete questions, and he kind of took to me a little bit. I started developing this basketball show while I was on Friday Night Lights, and I was sending him drafts, and he's giving me notes on it, and et cetera, et cetera. And then from that idea, the constant want to create and own and build, and, oh, you got a production company? Oh, so that means you could do what? What do you do with a production company? Okay, it does this. Okay. And then I just started to, like, stack bricks on top of bricks and pieces on top of pieces, and wanted to keep building something to do exactly what he said, to control my own destiny. You know, I saw a lack of representation, you know, which now it seems like a cliche thing to say. But at the time... This was over 10 years ago. Over a decade ago, yeah. you know, from actor to understanding the usual suspects that will only go out for the same role and the disappointment on everybody that didn't get it, knowing that there wasn't a lot of roles out there that had the level of elevation that you needed in order to become a leading man, to actually get significant roles that really made a difference in your career. Right. That's kind of how it started from wanting more than just an actor kind of perspective. Then the creation and ownership piece, then it was like, all right, well, what do I need to start a production company? All right, cool, I need money, I need overhead, I need this, I need that, all right. So I started stacking jobs identifying people, having internal conversations with like my team. Right. I knew this production company was the way to go for me because I can create multiple things at one time. Right. The satisfaction I get as an artist that I had to wait so long for as an actor to go from like, you know, shooting a movie to editing a movie to it comes out. Right. I can see that in a smaller step process when it comes to producing other things, you know, right. Right. for other people. Right. That's another thing. I like seeing other people win, man. So yeah. I like to build projects for people and talent if I created more roles and more projects, it would be more for everybody to eat. Like a form of paying it forward almost. Exactly. I mean, it's interesting, like sitting down talking with you, it's one name that we haven't brought up enough. That's Forrest Whitaker. Forrest Whitaker. African-American leading man kind of guy. It's only a few of them, especially at that time. And yeah. Forrest, you know, in his success, leveraged it into founding significant production. Mm -hmm. You know, hired Nina Yang, Bon Jovi to help run it. My first meeting with Nina, she was like, I'm looking for young filmmakers to help champion, to help 
make films with yep. and grow our company as well as grow their careers. Forrest making that decision to form his own company was how we met each other. That's deep. Yeah, I never connected those dots. That's deep. Yeah, so I'm super proud to see you doing that because some of the best production companies are found out by actors a lot of times. But then you got significant. Which mm-hmm. was like a huge inflection point for us. Yes. You know, and, yes. and it was amazing having Forrest there the whole step of the way. Like, I know y'all had your private conversation, yep. you know what I mean? But yep. I was talking to him. He's a director as well. Yep. And I never had those conversations with him. I was more on the acting side because at that time, that's what my vision was. Totally. But it was crazy. I, I can only imagine the conversations and how influential he was with you and oh, what man. you were doing at the time. Yeah. It was like It was incredible. Insane. It was incredible. So, like, for me, I've never been shy with the ambition of, like, taking big swings and, and leaps. I, I'm hungry. I want it. You know what I mean? Yep. I see it. I'm going for it. Yeah. You know, you've always been a patient person. What increased your appetite or bandwidth of wanting to kind of do more and start your own production company? Because I know that was something that developed after you had some major films under your belt. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So what made you want to kind of like dive into that? That's a great question. I grew up playing team sports. I come from a big family. You know, so I always liked community and the idea of community. And it was always something that I figured would happen at some point. Okay. You know, a production company, if I was successful as a director. But yeah, I was taking stuff one step at a time, man. You know, and some of the greatest advice I ever got in life was um being a college football player and, and I play wide receiver. I had a coach my last year. Okay. And y'all rarely dropped passes, you know, mm-hmm. in practice, but I dropped one and he was like, hey, man, <laughs> catch first. Because if you don't catch it, nothing else matters. You know what I'm saying? And like, catch it first, then turn, then see the defense. I'm actually not a patient person, hmm. you know, like it's something I got to work at. Got you. You know, making films is so difficult and I've been blessed to have films with a lot on the line, but also left me with like a slim margin of error. You know what I'm saying? Got you. So I had to make sure that the movie's good. I can't be thinking about anything else at the time. And, and I was blessed in that Fruitville, we got Creed, Creed, we got Panther. And then after Panther, I had a little bit of time. Mm-hmm. That was when the time was right. Got you. The catch was making the company. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't worried about anything else but that. And, we were fortunate enough that like right around the time, Shaka King, who's the co-writer and director of Judas and the Black Messiah, a friend of me and Zinzi's, Zinzi Evans Kugler is a co-founder of Proximity. And Shaka King, you know, taught us about this project. And me and Zinzi loved the pitch. Mm-hmm. You know, and at the same time, Maverick Carter, who I met through you. Yep. Maverick was like, hey man, we got, you know, we want to do Space Jam. Uh, you know, nice. um, and that Damn, was when, back then. That was when I, yeah, that was when I sat down with Zinz. Awesome. And we were like, yo, does it make sense to do this now? I'm not actively making a movie right now. And she was like, oof, we need somebody else. And then we were like, let's see what Sev's doing. You know, and we met with Sev Ocohanian. Sev's a writer and a producer. And, you know, he was on the ground, producer for Fruitville. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of just did searching and, you know, won a bunch of awards at Sundance. And he was in town for a screening. San Francisco, we went to the screening, loved the movie. And kind of like talked to Sev, like, hey, you know, we got these two movies. Can we start to put something together? Mm -hmm. From there, man, it was... Just kind of kept rolling. Yeah, it it was all based off relationships. Yep. I got a love of podcasts. You know this, but this is why we're doing this right now. And and want to learn television, you know what I mean? So you're hiring folks, you know, expanding. And and you here doing this. And I mean, it's exhilarating, man. And and I got a taste of it with you and Creed, too. So Stephen Cable Jr. is the director of Creed 2, currently directing Transformers, The Rise of the Beast. Yeah, I think it's one of the Beast Wars joints. I'm excited about it. But I don't know if you remember some of those conversations we were having. I did. Yeah. And I can only imagine that being difficult and new for you totally. to step away or take a couple steps back from something that's so personal to you, yeah. that you created, that you built, yeah. and see somebody else and help somebody else, but still give them the room and space to have their own identity on it. Yeah. But, Mike, but, I loved it, man. Like, I, I, I learned awesome. that about myself. You know what I'm saying? Like, when y'all were calling, I remember Cable was like, hey, man, we need another day. <laughs> you know, and he kind of said it, like, offhand. And I was like, oh, shit, man, Cable, I might need another day. Yeah. So I remember going in, like... <laughs> going in there, like, hey, I remember going in, yeah. My guys need another day. <laughs> <laughs> like, I went to Irwin's office, and then y'all had, like, was y'all shooting 50-some days? Yeah. And um, I don't know if I even told you this story, bro. <laughs> I'm in Erwin's office. Uh-huh. Erwin Winkler, he's the founder of Winkler Films. He's the original producer of Rocky with his partner Bob Charnoff who's no longer with us. But he also has produced a ton of other stuff. He's Martin Scorsese's go-to producer as well. Mm-hmm. But this is a Hollywood legend. And along yeah. with him and Sylvester Stallone, they were the guys who said, all right, Coogler, all right, Mike, go. Yep. You know, they were the only people that had the power to do that. 
Give us know, the green light to just go yeah. go run with it. So obviously those guys hold a special place in our hearts, and you know, uh, <laughs> you, can't, you can't say enough about him. Nah, but, but I'm in his office. Uh -huh. so I'm like Irwin, man. You know, Mike and, and Cable. They said they need these days. They just got <laughs> off the phone with me, man. They were exasperated. You know, we gotta get this done. So he's like, all right, uh, <laughs> he's, exactly he's like, ready. he's like, all right, well, that's the schedule right there on my desk. He's like, pick that up, kind of go through it and make sure there's nothing in there that's crazy. Mm. So we don't go to MGM looking like a bunch of assholes. You uh -huh. know what I'm saying? We asked for this extra day. So I pick up the schedule yeah. that he points to, and it's like a novel. You know what I'm saying? I'll pick it up, <laughs> and it's just massive. And I'm flipping through all these pages, and it gets to day 105, <laughs> day 106, <laughs> day 107. Well, what movie and, is and that? And I'm like, yeah, yo, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, wait a sec, like. <laughs> I say, Erwin, you sure this is the right schedule? It says 108 days. He goes, 108 days? Man, give me that thing. <laughs> like, he, he, he takes it, looks at it. He says, oh, I'm sorry, this is the Irishman. <laughs> <laughs> That's a crazy story. <laughs> oh, my bad. There's it's, it's, it's crazy there. And I'll pick it up, and it's like, a, yeah, it's like, it's like, it feels like one sheet of paper. You know what I mean? So about this one day, I be. Mean, yeah. I never knew that story. That's crazy. That's a great one. But the battles that you had to fight, for us that we never knew, like you were showing up in a way that you couldn't show up before. Yeah. You got us what we needed. You know what I'm saying? Like we got what we needed to actually kind of like finish the mission, which yeah. is like awesome. And I love the movie, man. It was great. Like Thank watching you. it was just like, man, no extra stress. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm just able to see it for what it is. You know I'm like? It's, it's like being a grandfather. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like fantastic, man. Look at this. <laughs> yeah, look at my, <laughs> look at the walking and talking. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's all great. You know what I'm saying? Like I love it. You know, so I had that very limited experience, mm -hmm. like, you know, um, a few things, like a few calls, a few conversations I had with y'all, and, and then so it was like, man, let's go for real on this. And what I've learned is just like, it's hard, bro. Yeah. It's very, very complicated, much more political, you mm -hmm. know? A lot of time, conversations oftentimes gotta happen so many more times than yes. they do as a director, right? Yes. You know, you can talk to this person, and then you gotta go update this other person. Yep. You gotta update this other part. You gotta have a post mortem. Yep. You know what I mean? And, yep. and a recap. Yep. And just in terms of like advice, I just can't speak enough about two things: hiring the right people. Yep. That's crucial. It's everything, you know. Crucial. And taking your time doing that. For any business owners out there that's listening, mm -hmm. make sure you take your time. You don't rush into hiring anybody ever. And listen to your gut. Yeah. Like I think your instinct, let that be your North Star as much as possible. And and there's gonna be mistakes. Everything's not gonna happen exactly how you want it, you know, but just stick with it, see things through. Yeah. When those projects finish, bro, when Judas finished and when Space Jam finished, when you work on somebody else's vision, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But you help them along the way, hmm. it was a whole nother level of, of pride. Yeah. This is our Prox Rex segment, and we're going to share recommendations for anybody out there who's listening who is starting a company. One of the biggest recs I have is a book called Creativity, Inc. It's about Pixar and its founding. It's written by Ed Catmull. Um, it's a fantastic book. Pixar is like right down the street from where I grew up in the Bay Area, the East Bay. And uh, it was an exhilarating experience reading about, you know, how that company came together and created some of the greatest animated films in cinematic history, in my opinion but it's really an illuminating um, under the hood look of a company that's firing on all cylinders and kind of building as they go. And um, like a day-to-day -day wreck that I would have is, you know, try to have as many standing meetings with your entire company present hmm. as possible. That was actually advice I got from Jim Morris, who actually runs Pixar now. Have as many meetings when everybody can kind of, you know, look each other in the eyes, whether it's over Zoom, whether it's in person, and um, kind of talk about what the company is and have a chance to talk about any issues that may be coming up at Prox, we meet pretty much once a week, at least, sometimes more. As we've been doing that, it's been incredibly helpful. That's awesome. I was going to pretty much say something similar as far as, like, having team and company meetings as much as possible. When you first start up, getting in a space and talking through the company as you guys are defining it, because it's going to evolve, and it's going to evolve with time. So whatever you start out with, Nine times out of 10 is not going to be what you end up with a couple months from now. You know what I'm saying? You know, a year from now. So continue to have that evolving conversation as the culture, as your company is defined, I think is going to be extremely crucial for you as you move forward because that's going to help define how you hire, who you hire, who's the right fit. It'll help quickly determine 
what's working for you and what's not working for you based on those core values that you guys are constantly refining as a group. So I think that's kind of like the number one recommendation I have. In Proximity is a production of Proximity Media. If you like the show, be sure to follow, rate, and review it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And tell your friends and loved ones to do the same. If you have someone in your life who you think would like the show, send them a link. Learn more at proximitymedia.com and follow at Proximity Media on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. The show is produced by me, Paula Mardo. Executive producers are Ryan Kugler, Zinzi Kugler, Sev Ohanian, and me. Our theme song and additional music is composed by Ludwig Gorenson. Ken Nana is our sound designer and mix engineer. Paulina Cherizova is our production assistant. Audio editors for this episode are Shayna Deloria and me. Special thanks to Monica Sanand, Noah Gorlick, Nawan Samfel, the whole Proximity Media team, and to you for listening. Meet you back here next week. I'll go, I'll go first. Uh, uh, hey, it's Michael B. Jordan. I'm uh, you know, sitting across from Ryan Coogler. And yeah, we're here to talk through some uh, life experiences <laughs> with my brother. Hey, can I, can I make him do a take two? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>